The trailer that you've just watched is not the trailer for Sonic. If you go to the movies today, Sonic is playing. This trailer was created by a Kenyan artist, a 3D artist. This is the level we are at today. If you look at your screen right now, you're looking at a video, an extract of a video, a screenshot from YouTube that shows you the number of views that one of the videos that he created about a year ago has. That's right, 200 million views. 200 million views. When we talk about content and when we talk about the creative industry, it's happening right here. And I'm talking about somebody that I've worked with. When we look at Nollywood, and I'm sure you guys are pretty much aware of it, Nollywood is making some millions of dollars, about $500 million a year, and millions of jobs to be created by that industry. But what's really funny is when you look at the venture capitalist in, uh, capital investments in Africa in 2019, you realize that, I mean, look at the numbers where fintechs sit. The creative industry is not really there. Yet we have that level of capabilities. I felt that it was important for us to give you some sort of context. We have on the panel some people that have been working towards helping Africa achieving those sustainable development goals. And most of the time, we forget what they are. So I felt it was important for us to have it on screen. I wanted to share some sort of context in terms of what world we live in today. I don't know how many of you have heard of what we call now the sharing economy. Um, back there, in, when we were discussing with the panel, we were talking about the fourth industrial revolution. So the world has changed, and what we have right now is the sharing economy powered by three internets, transportation internet, energy internet, communication internet, that all power what we call the internet of things. That's all well said. Let's talk about something a bit close to what this event is about. Creativity, music. Today, technology is a great equalizer. What you have on your screen right now is a platform called Splice. All the producers in this room have probably heard of this platform. Today, you don't need crazy access to samples anymore. They are available online at a fraction of the cost that they used to be sold for. No excuses. We all have access to the very same technology, the very same resources. The world is really flat. But creative is powered by tech and specifically by digital. But what is digital? A lot of people talk about digital, and when they talk about digital, they see a channel. Digital is not a channel. Digital is not even a service offering, but digital is a way of thinking. And it's a way of thinking that we need to adopt in our organizations and in Africa if you want to move forward very fast. But most importantly, we need to transform. And when we talk about digital transformation, it's really about people. And when I talk about digital, one of the things that is really, really booming in technology today is what we call artificial intelligence. But what is artificial intelligence? Everybody in this room has used artificial intelligence before. Traffic lights are controlled by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence runs some smart cars. When you book your next plane ticket, you know, um, and you know that those prices change pretty quickly, it's not done by people. People cannot process data as fast as machines. Artificial intelligence probably had something to do with the last ticket that you booked. I don't know how many of you guys shop on Amazon or even on Jumia. What you see on your page is suggested by AI. So every single thing that you do, and I'm so glad to talk about this particular platform because it was created by the creator of this event, Mike Strano. It's called My Movies Africa, which is basically a platform where you can rent movies when you want, powered by artificial intelligence. So 
Artificial intelligence literally runs our lives today. And there are a bunch of platforms out there, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And the winners today are the people that are going to own the new platforms. I know we are actually at Ongea, and we, we're actually motivating people to create content. Content is great, but the guys that are really making a killing and that really have the influence are the owners of YouTube, the owners of Facebook. So something to think about. We might need to create our platforms in Africa. Talking about the world we live in again in today is the power that the world has given to the people. In 2019, I do not think that if you lived on this planet, you wouldn't have, if you haven't heard of any of these people on screen today, you probably left Earth and came back in 2020. Power to the people. And more importantly, everybody is talking about millennials. It's yesterday. Gen Z were born literally when the internet started. For them, they don't understand a world that does not have the internet. So the internet is not only a distribution channel, it's a little bit like water to them. But Gen Z is also now old school. Now we have what we call Gen Alpha. Guys born between 2011 to let's say, and that's how it was classified till 2025. So those guys are the kids that you have to whom when you give a book, they try to swipe because they use to actually, to digital devices. They used to holding iPads. And to those guys, digital is a completely different story. Content is king. Everybody talks about that. One of the very important things we need to talk about is context. Where do you use that content? You've seen on the video, the first video, it was Andrew Kagia that created it, but Kagia created some videos, the first animated video in Kenya before, and it didn't work. The context was wrong, right? So he timed it so well when he released the video that has 200 million views and it worked just before the release of Captain America Civil War and it just blew up. One of the things that we really, really need to talk about is distribution. Back in the days, if you didn't know somebody on TV or in a newspaper, you wouldn't go anywhere. Today, distribution is free. The internet is free. We all have the opportunity to become um, what we call to be in the media business. And that is the real opportunity. Create content, push your content. It is free. And one of the last slides that I have is really something that talks about the fact that the products of the creative economy can help shape who we are. When you watch a movie, when you read a book, you know, it somehow, you know, subliminally change, changes what it is that you think, and your opinion about certain things, and ultimately certain values in society. So it's very important that we really spend a lot of time into that. And my last slide is something that I always remember. Nokia was, you know what Nokia was in Africa. No one could touch Nokia, but they couldn't adapt. They got disrupted. They were too slow to change. And this is what their CEO says. We didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Disrupt to Thrive and welcome to this panel. Today we're going to talk about disruptive technologies and what it is that we can do and imp the impact that it has on the creative economy and what it is that we can do to help uh, the continent and Kenya go forward. On my panel, I'm so honored because I've got some people that don't actually need an introduction. Because there's a lady on the panel, I'm going to start by her. You know, we need to be... Uh... So we have Betty Nabangala, who's basically a tech superstar. This is someone that a long time ago created some trading platform for the NAC because they realized that university students and people at a certain level were not really conversant with these technologies and they wanted to democratize that aspect of technology. So they had to build some platforms, help some university students and so on, go onto the platforms. And today, she's 
a pro she does production, and also she manages one of the greatest artists that Kenya knows, Giuliani. Next to her, we have a gentleman called Chris Sinanu. Chris Sinanu is basically in the creative economy and into digital transformation. And he's a serial entrepreneur, and for those of you who watch TV, you've probably seen him on Lions Den. I don't know how many, how many of you guys watch TV, and that's a very good question, actually, you know? And he invests in fintech, in digital, and in music. On my left, I have a gentleman called Michael Onyango. Now, when you guys ask yourself, what's going to happen to the future of this country? when it comes to blockchain, when it comes to technology, when it comes to AI. Michael is one of the people that has worked with government to draft policies, and these are the guys that are the visionary that are going to help take the country forward. And he is also working in policy making and is really trying to help content creators go very fast. The last panelist that we have in the extreme left is no other than Brian Afande, who has been literally in the creative economy and in the tech, in the, in the, in the tech space as well. From DJ to being on TV, yes, we, we know that, to being on TV and now to being a techpreneur. And what I like about Mike is that he runs an outfit that is focused on technologies, some emerging technology that is still considered a bit novel, and it's VR. I know you guys have a new term for it, so when I ask you a question, I'm sure you're going to, you're going to drop it. So, panelists, welcome, and thank you very much for making time to be here. We're going to dive into questions. So, the first thing I would like to talk about is, and this question is directed to Chris or Mike, but I think I would start with Mike. I'm a, left, I'm a lefty, so, you know, so. When people see software, computers, and data, and when they talk about digital transformation, they see computers, they see software, they see data. I see people. I see the transformation of people. And this begs, begs the question, when we talk about digital transformation in an organization, in a company, is it really the role of the IT head, the CIO? Should it go even up to HR level? What are your views on that? Uh, Chris, thank you very much for having us all on the panel. And I think with the slides that presented, we can actually go home, because you already said everything. <laughs> but coming back to your question, um, you know, the future of work, which is what is happening today, and coming back to your question, about digital transformation and who it relates to. Let me put it this way. If anyone or if you are affected by technology, then you have to be involved in it. And I'll give you a very simple example. So, you know, all the phones that I can guarantee 95% of you have in this room, you probably know that has replaced almost 15 different devices, which were all standalones in offices. So typically, some of you may not know this, but a couple of years ago, um, a typical office had what was called a fax machine, uh, a photocopier, um, you know, it had a computer for you to write on, uh, it had a scanner for you to scan documents on and all these things. But now, with your single device in your hand, you're able to accomplish all those things. So coming back to your question, where you say that who does it affect within an organization? It affects everybody. And the reality is, with the current future of work scenario, every single, I'll say that almost 95% of the jobs that you're all doing now and continue to do are being disrupted constantly and will keep changing. So therefore, somebody who's seated in you know, for example, if, if you're working in the supplies department, you know, if you're a purchasing clerk and you think that, you know, I will continue purchasing, actually there's enough data uh, and AI, as I said, which can be fed in, which can actually purchase better than you, and who doesn't go home at night the way you go home at night? 
even a newscaster. For example, you know, you may think that being a news anchor, you are safe from being disrupted. But you know what? There's actually virtual reality presenters who can present for more than 24 hours without taking a break to go to the toilet or have tea. So every single sector and every single person is actually affected by these disruptions. And it is important that we understand what they are, where they are, and how it is that we as a continent and as a people must start fitting in and must start doing the right thing so that we're not disrupted, but we're riding the wave and we are part and parcel of the new economy that's now running. Thank you so much, Michael. So um, I have another question for you. You know, it's a follow up. Um, you know, the thing about disruption is it really happens in your blind spot. You know, so you're doing what you do every day and you think everything is fine. And then all of a sudden it happens. But um, so, so, so where is the gap in, in the organization? Where is, where is the real gap? Do you think it's leaders that have to be trained um, first now? And I mean, quickly uh, brought up to speed. And then, or, or, or what do you think? How, how do you think that would actually really change? It, it's interesting you say that. And, you know, because a lot of you are sitting in this room may say that, you know, in my organization, if my leaders are not being trained and don't know about the future of work, then they're the ones who are failing me. But actually, you're failing yourself. It's actually your own self-responsibility to understand and to really know what is happening. So for example, you know, um, it's interesting, jobs like, you know, and coming back to, you know, to just be a bit more practical about that, something like a, a, as an accountant or even doctors, and I'd said this a couple of months ago, I made a statement um, on national television and uh, I must say this, that the whole Kenya Medical Association came against me because I did say that you could be able to get AI to do a far better and more accurate job than radiologists. And there was a huge, huge um, Twitter attack on me. And, uh, and, but let's face it, it is true. For example, you know, um, you, know you can actually get, um, you know, there's IBM Watson, you know, which, which, is, which, is, uh, which is one of the AI machines that, 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 that IBM has. And it can more accurately, it can 99.3% be able to detect cancer within a scan, something which would probably take a doctor um, a far longer time to do. So technology has disrupted us in all fields, from medicine um, into music, as you said earlier on, uh, you know, into every single place. So it is not just, so it is interesting, in as much as we're talking about the creative economy today, we must understand that these technologies actually go way beyond what is just the creative economy sector. All right, thank you so much, Michael. Um, because I don't want to move away from this topic, you know, I'm going to go to you, Brian. It, you oh, Chris, you want to say something? Yeah, can I jump? All right. I think um, I just want to say, you see, digital is not a concept. The fourth industrial revolution is already with us. Digital is a lifestyle. Um, it's what we do today. So I think there's there's a misconception that there's something bigger or different to come. But I just want to be very clear that it's, it's here with us today. And so we all just have to accept that moving forward, what we have in terms of platforms, what we have in terms of ways of accessing content, is not, not going to change drastically. We might just make a little bit of changes. You see, once the internet came, the only difference is that we're changing the speeds of the modem. We started from dial-up, we moved to wireless, we did a bit of VSAT, and now we are on fiber and GSM. All that's going to happen with GSM, you move from 3G, 4G, 5G, and what's going to happen from fiber is that you will have 100 meg at home, soon you'll have a gig, soon you'll have 10 gig. It just means that the future of work, work is not a place you go to. Work is something you do from wherever you want to because you have devices. It also means that for content, you're not going to move physically in order to get any content. From wherever you are, you can consume content, the same content on multiple devices. And so we have to look at digital from a point of lifestyle. And the digital that will work for me and make me efficient, both in my life, lifestyle, and work style, might be different from yours. We might have different preferences in devices, but it's all digital. And so people need to think that digital is a lifestyle, it's not a concept, it's not a theory. 
in digital is not about technology. Digital is about how we do what we do in our daily lives. Right. Um, now that you've said that, Chris, um, I, I think I would like to ask you another question. You know, when I arrived in Kenya, my plan was to build a company and build an office where people don't have to come to the office and work from home. But from experience, uh, to be honest, it, it, it didn't really work. <laughs> it, it just didn't work. So technology is moving so fast, but um, in certain economies, they have the discipline to use the, embrace the technology and really make the best of it. So what do you think in terms of the future of work? And now that you mentioned what you mentioned, mentioned speeds are getting faster and faster. So what, what do you see? I, I, I think you put it right. You had the intention of building a company where people will work without necessarily coming into a physical location. Now, the question that I'll have for you is, did you compensate them for output, or did you use the old compensation where you pay somebody monthly for input? Because in the new technology or in the new economy, I can be hired by a company in Yugoslavia. They don't care whether I spend two hours or 40 hours to do the work. They will only pay me after I have delivered. And so therefore, they don't care whether I'm on the beach. They don't care whether I'm in my bed. They just care on the deliverable. So moving forward, a lot of, in the creative economy and in, in the digital economy, a lot of people will be compensated for output. Provided you deliver the output, you get paid. If you don't, you get nothing. All right, thank you very much. Um, because we're staying the, more or less in the same topic, I would like to go to Brian. So, Brian, um, I, uh, when you looked at those slides, there was a slide that was talking about the fact that technology is, the, is a great equalizer, right? And what I mean basically is some people are in the States right now, and I've worked with a lot of guys that I've tried to train, and the mentality was always, yeah, but we're in Kenya or we're in Africa. Guys are, let's say, in the States or in Asia, and they have access to so many different things. So, um, do you really think technology is an equalizer? I think so. Uh, I think it's one of the biggest equalizers out there because it doesn't, when I'm, when I'm actually using the technology, the technology doesn't have biases that human beings have. You know, it doesn't have certain social, mental constructs that human beings already have that are predisposed to. So, from from even some of the stuff, some of the work that we're doing, let's say we're in an opportunity right now and we are, we're shooting this live in 360, just using technology. So we're using, yes. yes, we're shooting right now. There's a link up, you can see all of us in 360. But this is why I'm saying it's an amazing equalizer because someone really doesn't have to be here to feel like they were part of the, the whole summit. The sense of presence has allowed them to be in a position whether or not they had the money, whether or not they had the resources, they only needed one thing that would be able to transmit. The, they, they only needed one device that was able for them to be, to be in this space at this time right now. Mm -hmm. So I personally think that the way we're going with technology and also in, in retrospect, it's always been one of those things that my back down doesn't really matter as long as I can use the technology, whether or not I'm using it for good or bad, which is, I think, one of the things that also, I don't know if we're going to discuss about it, but there's also technology that is being used, we'll say for bad, and there's for good. So which side do you belong to? And a lot of young people, when you're thinking about, I work with a lot of young people, but one of the, one of the things I've seen that motivates them is money, the output. I believe the fortune is in the journey. Like if I go through the journey, then I have the fortune. Whether or not I have the money, it doesn't matter. But a lot of young people would actually be motivated to go with the money and then reverse engineer from there and say, as long as I can get this money, then I can use technology for bad as well. So this is why it's a great equalizer because it doesn't care if you have a bank account that has money or your race, yeah. So thanks for that. So you're one of these entrepreneurs that really, really took a chance and decided to build a business that not the common Monanche out there would actually build, a VR technology company. Yeah. Was it very difficult because the learning curve, back, backstage you told me the learning curve is, is kind of a bit yeah. steep, but so was it very difficult to, to start a business like that? 
you know, so, so what did you need? So, so how, how, how difficult was that? I think in, in retrospect, one of the things that was more or less like a winning formula was tenacity. Like we just sat in there and they, that grit was real. We sat in there. At that particular time, there were no universities in the world that you would get a virtual reality degree from. There are no courses that you would do that. But we graduated from the prestigious school of YouTube. How many guys graduated <laughs> from that school? Thank you. Yeah. So we graduated from that school. And we built machines, computers, created workflows, pipelines, based on stuff that we could only read online. Which some people would come and join the company later, but they would never they would never experience what it meant for my business partner and myself to set it up. That's why part of our metaculture in the company is that each and every person understands the story of where the company was bought. Because when you come in, you're part of a bigger vision. And the rest is also God, to be honest with you. It depends on who you believe in. But there's things that we did in our lives that we would say the stars aligned at a specific place for us and we some doors were opened that helped us elevate and scale our company to what it is right now all right yeah i see thank you now betty um i wanted to engage you when it comes to content creation artist development but you happen to be a tech superstar as well so is there something you'd like to add to the question that i've asked him um very early you've built some platforms trying to democratize some technologies um how challenging was it? Was it easy? Was it, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. Okay, uh, so what we're building, um, what you're referring to, we built a virtual trading platform that simulated the NSE. And the goal was to help uh, high school and university students learn how the stock market works with like real time data, but like virtual money. Um, in terms of the challenge, we, when we started out, we were in Strathmore. Um, we had good support in terms of um, like structural support, like access to internet and space to work, um, and mentors and feedback. And I think just that environment made it kind of easier for us to learn what we needed to learn faster. Um, we ended up having to do a lot of learning on our own, despite the fact that we were all tech and IT students at the time. There's a lot we had to teach ourselves. Um, but I think being in that uh, school environment and getting access to people in the industry kind of helped us do a lot in the first, um, like, one to two years, and then, yeah. All right. So, so, so do you think it's actually pretty straightforward for youngsters today, you know, to actually get access and get the support that they need to build? What, what would um, you say? I would say it's pretty straightforward to start. And then once you start and you're consistent, then you, you kind of just push your way into what you need, into the support that you need, the people that you need to meet, and the resources that you need. So once you start and are consistent, then you will definitely make your way there, yeah. All right, so I want to take you to a different place now. I want us to move to a place where technology empowers the creative economy um, and artistry. You manage one of the biggest stars in this market, Giuliani. So we would like to hear a little bit more about your journey and the plans that you have and how you had to adapt and probably change your business model. Um, what are the things that you have in store? Um, so it's a very exciting experience working with Giuliani uh, because he's an artist who already has a track record. Um, so um, like some of the groundwork has been laid. Um, how we've had to change our model, um, we know that um, Giuliani has a lot of influence and he has like a wide fan base. Um, and there's the traditional ways of, um, of making money in the music business, um, a record label deal, um, gigs, or any of those things. And while we still pursue those avenues, we had to realize that we, we win if we can have direct access to our fans, because the fans definitely want to pay for Giuliani things, from music to merchandise to anything else that he's doing. We just have to make sure that we have um, direct access to them, to um, engage them, to be able to make them feel that they're being hard and they're valued, 
and that way they are able to continue to engage with us and pay us. So technology um, plays a huge part in that where um, we need technology to scale and to communicate with our fans. Uh, we're currently building, so we are softly launching this thing called Giuliani Access, which is how um, we give back to, to the fans who made Giuliani who he is, and at the same time, we're able to monetize directly from the fans. So with Giuliani Access, um, we use Giuliani's influence to attract deals and discounts and different opportunities from corporate companies and other organizations. Um, and then the fans can plug in uh, by paying like a subscription fee and then you get access to all of these benefits. The premise of it is Giuliani has access to, to lots of, um, lots of like, benefits, like a, like a free meal or a meeting with someone important or funding for his project. So we are building a platform where we can um, have those benefits trickle down to his fans as well. Um, so we've been doing this for a while. We kind of started building like a business model, business case around one fan. Like if we can engage you, um, create content with you, and then convert you into paying um, to scale that to everyone else, then we need technology. So we are incorpor incorporating a lot of AI in terms of how fast we move a fan from user to customer. Like how easy is it to buy an album? Do you have to go to the website and then go to the shop and then buy? Or can you just be um, scrolling online and get a pop-up and then buy instantly? Um, we're also releasing Giuliani's fourth album this year. Um, and we'll have a lot of, we'll have some virtual reality projects. Um, um, sorry to stop you there. Are you working with? Yeah, I was just gonna say, how <laughs> come uh, we were not consulted on this? <laughs> Maybe we had to get here fast. Um, but technology is definitely an important tool for how we get to monetize the funds and also monetize from the other side um, of the corporate angle. Um, so when it comes to like endorsements and those brand deals that artists do, we, are, um, we, we want to play the long game with that where instead of doing like one engagement for six months, we also have a subscription program for the corporate companies where if you pay X amount a year, then you get a year of publicity and endorsement. You get access to Giuliani at a discount for like performances and things like that. And most importantly, which is what the corporates want, they get direct access to Giuliani fans, which we have because we're building out a system where we can communicate with our fans directly. Social media is good, but social media is for like promo and banter. You can't really get actionable feedback or actionable um, results or conversions just from social media. Okay, yeah. thank you so much for that. Um, I'm a struggling artist, so I'm definitely going to take some notes. Yeah, yeah, you can laugh, but you should try it. You know, um, so I'm definitely going to take some notes for a <laughs> from you. So, Chris, um, talking about artists, talking about royalties, talking about um, piracy, right? You Actually, can I add one more thing? Yes, you may. Um, what, what Chris said earlier about um, uh, work and about um, creating an office where people don't come to work and did you co compensate them based on output? Uh, because money is a struggle for artists. We've had to build our business in a way that everyone who works for us or works with us has to be motivated enough to be able to do the work and then get paid based on outputs because we can't afford to have someone um, sit in the office and get a monthly salary if it's not resulting in something actionable. Yes. So that's another way we had to change the way we do business. Definitely, thank you, Betty. So Chris, so where do you see in your, in your, in your current life, actually, and in your past life as well, you've worked with a lot of telcos, with ISPs, with telcos, so you know that business. Um, I'm one of those people that believes that internet service providers and telcos play a tremendous role into what happens in, in, in the industry now, in the creative economy and so on, especially on digital. So, do you think, what, what do you think will be put in place when it comes to piracy? Because you guys can deny it, but I'm sure that you guys download movies. You can deny it, we all do it, and we're all guilty of it, but um, if a lot of content creators actually start producing a lot of content, quality content, we're going to get to a point where people start downloading that stuff. So what happens, what do you have to say about ISPs, their role in this? Thanks for putting me on the spot. 
Um, I'll, I'll take this from two angles. One, technology, and two, regulation or policy. So the truth of the matter is that I think we are still at a very nascent level or stage in Africa to start shutting things down without the right policy. Remember, YouTube and the, the learnings that people have had in order to bring themselves up. We say with digital, the world is flat. But if ISPs in Africa were to have started by shutting things down, we would not be where we are. So I think what we need is the copyright acts. We need to be able to protect IP coming from proper regulatory and policy point of view. And then ISPs can start to shut down things or block certain IPs. Um, one of the very good examples I have is that the last election, I was at that time the chairman of Kenik. Kenik is where all the domains for Kenya are, .ke. And because of the media blackout, the only place people could get news from for a time being was online. And we really struggled hard to keep the population informed by keeping these domains up. If as ISPs, you also start blocking, we would have had a total blackout. So sometimes the issue of uh, ISP blocking, ISPs are enablers. We provide platforms and connectivity for people to do stuff. Okay. The real crux of the matter on um, IP or, or, or downloading stuff uh, is really a policy issue. And we need the Copyright Act to come in place um, to do that protection for content providers and artists. All right, thank you for that. And that would take me to, <laughs> to Mike, because um, you, you work with government. You, you, you advise governments, you advise companies, and so on. Um, he talks about this, and I see data protection as well. Who talks about content, talks about data. So what do you think, how well are we doing in Africa when it comes to data protection? Okay, so a very great question. First and foremost, I think that um, we must stop this thing as Africans as simply copying what is being done in Europe and what's being done in America. So we must stop that. And you people sitting in this room, you must stop saying, because Europe has data protection, we also need data protection. Who told you? <laughs> Who lied to you? There's some certain things that we still need to do. We must have space to experiment. We must have space to be able to develop some certain things. And let me just go in a bit further so that, you can, so that we're all together on this. Did you know that every single month on the continent of Africa, one million people are turning 18 years old? So that wow. is, so, okay. so that's a new market. But that's also competition for you, but also tells you how fast and how big we're growing. But the other thing is this, you know, to jump the gun and to throw the responsibility of, you know, of, of expanding uh, capacity or expanding connectivity to ISPs or to telcos is also a very lazy way of governments running away from the responsibilities. So we cannot be speaking about the digital economy, the future of work, without connectivity. And, and let, me, let, me, let me explain this a bit better. So, you know, where across the continent of Africa, including Kenya, including the various counties where you may be coming from, how much of the budget has been allocated towards connectivity? You'd always talk about we want money for roads, we want money for water, but we all now know that the place that has the greatest amount of new jobs and the greatest amount of income is within the digital economy. The top five companies in the world, look at them. Google, Amazon. You know, Google, Amazon, you know, and all of them. Which road are they using? But yet, you'll demand that you want roads. So, you know, you also need to understand, as a people, some of the demands you need to be making from your governments and what needs to be put in place. Otherwise, we get left behind. And just to kind of like sum up some certain things, it's interesting. So, you know, the very same Googles, the very same Microsofts are actually setting up big and huge operations on this continent. So you should ask yourself the question, 
Why are they setting up huge operations here and not expanding back at home where they are? Because the new economy, the new human resource, the new ideas are you people in this room. And if you don't understand that, and if you don't get that right, you'll keep thinking that you need to be on the other side and not on this side. Ashley, if you look at all the new content that has come out in terms of all the big movies, look at all of them. Where are the stories from? What are they about? So we need to very quickly rethink ourselves, rethink where it is that we're putting our priorities are, and know that for us to be able to play within uh, the future of work and the new economy, we've got to get our digital infrastructure right. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, because we don't have so much, we don't have that much time, I still would like to ask you a question. This begs a very important question. Everybody that is sitting in this room right now probably has a LinkedIn account, a Facebook account, or a YouTube account, or an Instagram account. My take has always been who owns the platform controls um, your mind, you know? So um, it's sad that I, want, that I talk about this. Kobe Bryant was involved in an accident. What happened the next, the three days after his, his passing, everything that I saw on my YouTube feed was only Kobe Bryant. So clearly, clearly the algorithm is manipulated. So do you think it's about time that we move into building our own platforms that we own as Africans as well? So it's interesting. We don't have to even have to build our own platforms. What we need to do is have enough people who understand the tech, who understand the code, so that we can also write algorithms and also manipulate the AI to bias things for us and towards us. Thank you so much. So this takes me to Brian. Mr. Brian, um, you faced a particular challenge and you tried to address it in the previous question, but you wanted to demystify technology, specifically VR. Um, a lot of the people, be it in this audience or somewhere else, um, are still really looking at technology, you know, and I mean from far, it still looks like a remote thing that they cannot really comprehend. So I would like to, you to tell us what you had to do and what you're doing right now to help demystify um, technology, specifically the technologies that you're pushing, because you are one of the companies that are creating the next content experiences for Africa. You know, advertising is dead as we know it. We're moving to things that are a little bit more experiential. So I'd like to hear more about that. Thanks, thanks for your question. Um, I think every time I've gotten an opportunity to talk about what we do, I'm, I feel that it's it's necessary for us to, to explain something. So within, so you have a spectrum of technologies, right? So the spectrum is called the extended reality spectrum. So within the extended reality spectrum, it actually has three, uh, three different verticals. So you have augmented reality, which means that I'm extending. Augment is an English word for extending. So it means I can extend the reality of something using my phone or an, a tablet or anything that can help me extend that reality. And then the second vertical is virtual reality, which locks me in a 360 environment. It could be interactive. I could interact with this environment, but it doesn't allow me to see anything much out of that environment. And then you have mixed reality, which is a baby of augmented reality and virtual reality. So it allows me to, it allows me to, to extend and augment something, but at the same time, I can interact with everything happening around my environment in real time. So within that spectrum, we, we specialize in two of those verticals. So we specialize in augmented reality and virtual reality. We're what you call an extended reality agency. But let me back to the demystification. It's very important for us when we're talking about these technologies to realize that number one, they're nascent technologies, just like Chris said. There's, we're still in the beginning eras of these things, right? Remember, a child has to crawl before they walk. So when it comes to either 
matured, uh, when it comes to either matured uh, verticals that require more of implementation, because they've already worked on certain frameworks and it's just about implementation. But on the flip side, on, on, on where we exist, we need to make sure that we call it the three Ds. Number one, creating uh, access, which is democratization of the technology. How do we make sure that people are able to access it and also afford it affordably? Number two is demystification. How do you ensure that you guys actually come? So right now they stand 18 and 19. You can go and have VR experiences, AR. And we're talking about content here, but there's also solutions that you can be built on, on and leveraging on the technology itself. So the solutions that you can see, industry scalable solutions that have been created so that you can start understanding from a very grassroots level of what the technology could be in the market and what you can do it for you socially as well. And the last D is deployment. How do we start creating, deploying uh, software and hardware infrastructure? So in soft and hard infrastructure, I mean platforms and also hard infrastructure that would allow that would allow progression of this. So because of this, we go to where we have students, which are learning institutions, and we carry out hackathons, workshops, discussions, and these are demystification sessions where, whereby you, you, you're in touch with the technology itself. Because I think innovation is not something you can read about. It's something that really has to be demonstrated. So by demonstrating it, it's, it, it creates that it bridges a specific gap of creating some form of intimacy with something that you can get to understand. So it's very important for us to understand that you can create an intimate relationship digitally and with technology and try to understand what it can do for you, what it can't do for you, and how it can change lives around you. Just remember that we're in the brink of, like, it's a revolution. Now, the way we work, the way we relate to each other, and the way we the way we actually uh, relate to each other, work and talk, is going to be different. So how do we respond to this revolution? It's just not about, people say Africans are used to, the only concept that Africans understand is consumption. And I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of that because I think, I think it's one of the things that, for lack of a better word, belittles us. I'm not there just to consume content from YouTube. Just like what you said, why can't I create my own algorithms and patterns that will allow people to see, export some of our, um, export our culture, export our creativity? As Africans, do we really have to be the only people who are always receiving things? We receive aid, we receive content, we're not creating anything. That's why within the culture and creative economy, we believe that you can start producing your own stuff and export it leveraging and pivoting on the technology itself. But you need to create that intimacy with the technology to understand it. Thank you very much, Brian. So Chris, um, I have two more questions before we go into questions from you guys. One thing that I have to say is, I've been part of so many panels and so have you guys. But you know, we come here, we talk, we give big ideas. And then one year later, nothing has really happened. So, you guys start thinking about it. At the end of this, I would ask you, because I would like you guys to be accountable, I need you guys to do one thing this year, you know, towards contributing to the advancement of the creative economy. So, you think about it, you'll tell us what it is. So, Chris, um, I'd like to talk to you about, very quickly about, the amount of investment that goes towards the creative economy versus you are in, you're an investor, you've invested in fintech, you've invested in entertainment. You, so what are your thoughts on that? What do you think can be done and what do you think is done now? I, I think there's too little money going into the creative industries, full stop, just too little. From a point of view of angel investment, venture capital, private equity, just too little. Um, even from a grants perspective. Um, but, but I think the thing about the creative industry is that we need to start from home. We need to start developing the investment culture into the creative from Africans, from Kenyans, uh, because we are the ones who can appreciate what it is that is being, the content that is being created here, or the artistry that is being created here. Um, and to your second question, um, yes, personally, I've invested in music labels. Um, I represented Chocolate City here for five, six years. I'm part of Taurus. 
both Taurus Music and Taurus Events. Um, right now, I have an artist that I'm sponsoring personally, not under any of the label because th he didn't want to go under a label. You can name drop. This is the opportunity. <laughs> He's called Critical. He's new, um, and, I'm, and I'm supporting him. And that's because I believe, A, in him as a person, and I believe, B, in the creative industry, and I believe, C, in monetization of uh, platforms. And so I think more has to be done. There have to be more people like me who take up an artist and say, I'm going to sponsor you. Um, and there are going to have to be more people like her who are going to pick up an artist and say, I'm going to manage you. And between the sponsor or the person who puts in the cash and the person who can manage, there is value for the artist all around. Um, so too little money. Um, also, I think the challenge over there is that a lot of artists, uh, be they spoken artists, written artists, they don't know how to package themselves for investment. That's the biggest challenge. I have a lot of people who come to me and they say, I can sing. Well, singing is one thing. There's a difference between music and the business of music. Um, there's a difference between being able to sculpture and being able to be in the business of producing sculptures. And so the packaging, and I think there has to be more education, more capacity development that is put into the whole creative industry, such that artists are able to package themselves better and know what it is that they're actually selling out there. All right, thank yeah. you. Um, let me talk to Betty. I wanted to ask you a question, but I'm changing the question because of what Chris said. So first of all, you guys need to talk to each other. You know, definitely. I mean, this is... But then your model is not necessarily... Your model is more to use technology to generate, you know, funds and to reinvest into the artists, either branding and so on. Uh, when we were backstage, I asked you why your strategy was not to go to a record label, right? I mean, Salty Soul was sold to Universal now, so it's very easy. Now they know if they want a music video, they don't have to struggle to get money to create a music video, right? So what do you think the future looks like really here? Do you think, um, because you've been on this journey and m while it might have worked for you, I'm not very sure that it's going to work for all artists. I told you I'm a struggling artist, you know, so I know what it is. So, no, seriously, so, so, so what do you see? Uh, so, Julian, he says something that I think is very profound. He says, we attract, we don't chase. So, in terms of like a record label deal, we would definitely be open to partnerships like those. Uh, they just have to be right. And for the deal to be right, we have to have a very strong offering. And I think every artist needs to remember that the real power that you have is in the fans who support you. And if you can find a way to um, access that and, uh, and monetize it, then everyone else will see what you're doing and they'll come wanting to make the deals with you. Yeah, what was the other part of the question? What, um, no, it was basically about you know the record labels and do you think since they have an existing framework, Chris was talking about branding because music is not music, music is marketing, you know it's branding and marketing. So yeah, yeah. Do you so think you need them. Um, yeah, I think record labels um, are very valuable and for example like the deal that Saudi Soul made is very valuable because distribution is usually a challenge for all artists. So any access to to that kind of help is is important um, and. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot what I was saying. That's fine. So I can ask you the question again. Uh, yeah, sorry. Well, so, so it's basically where, what place do you think those big record labels are going to really have? I mean, in the future of music, let's say, for example, here in Kenya. I mean, Universal is in South Africa. There are lots of um, uh, companies here. There are lots of management companies that came into the country, you know, and trying to really... Um, the likes of Tempo, for example, and so on, that try to really take artists and invest in them. So do you think um, artists should rather do it themselves, or do you think the, the need for the, in this particular market, the need for the record label? Uh, okay, thanks. I remembered my train of thought. So um, Giuliani's career today is 16 years long, and I'd say now is when we're really figuring it out in terms of packaging his career and his music and himself into... Um, a business or an entity that can be invested in uh, by um, angel investors or VCs, but also by funds. So um, with our plan, we want to 
have direct access to the funds and we want to make money from the funds, but we also want to get the point where funds can invest in Giuliani as well. Um, and you know, maybe get ownership, like some ownership of the next song he releases and the royalties trickle down to everyone. Um, it's important to have the record label deals, but most important is that you find a way to, to get sustainable with just direct access to your funds because not everyone gets the deal and not everyone is interested in the deal uh, like your artist. And I'm actually curious to know why they would want the deal when you know they have access, they have you. Um, so the traditional ways of making money in music are valid and are still valuable. But to get yourself, to keep yourself um, alive up until the point where the deal comes, uh, just understand that your fans are the ones who give you the direct money and understand how to package yourself. All right, yeah. thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yes, but very quickly, yeah. because I would like to hear from the audience okay, as well. Okay, just right. very quickly. And uh, this is also to pose as a challenge. But also, I don't know, I can't say I'm a former artist because once an artist, always an artist. But from my background of being in music and doing what we did, one of the things I think, and this is, like I said, a challenge to all the young people in this room. And Chris said it, there's the business of music. As an artist, my business is not going to market my product. Yes, I can network with the right people who can help me. But you'd find that as an artist, I want to be the person writing the lyrics, going into the studio, recording. I've created my own beats. I'm doing this. I'm trying to still go out in the streets, hawk, and do that stuff. It's a business. The output is actually a collaborative process between people on the value chain. So as a person, if you, feel you if you feel like you're talented or this is where that you want to actually go, then you have to look at it as a business. And it's so sad, people say, if you want to hide something from Kenyans, put it in a book. Because the truth is, we don't read. We are always, and I'll go back to consumption, we are always sit down and read a book about someone who created a dynasty out of, a musician who created a dynasty out of his talent and understand the process. Because some of the institutions we are in will never teach you this stuff. When you go out there in the real market, no one cares about your degree. No one cares about anything. At the end of the day, as an individual, how can I ensure that I build either my brand, how do I understand brand management, how do I pivot on certain elements that I can work with, that can propel me to the next level. So it's up to you to start interrogating the norm and saying, this is my critical separation as an individual, and this is what I'm going to do just to ensure that I survive that digital trend. Because it's here and it's, it's real. Thank you so much. Um, we never have enough time. There are more questions that we would have wanted to ask them, but how about we hear from you? Um, do we have a microphone in the audience? Oh, cool. So are you, is there anyone that has a, a question directed to a particular panelist? Hi, my name is Mark Mukunya. I'm a photographer, a documentary filmmaker. My question is twofold, to Brian and Chris. For to Brian, uh, it's more like on your business model. You mentioned uh, augmented, VR, and MR. And your, your investment is very interesting. You're in a space that could change. For example, MR uh, Magic Leap is coming up, they're trying with their designs. Yeah. So as a creative, venturing into more of the technology-driven business, how are you able to pivot in cases of change? And how do you see you not being overtaken by uh, bigger and more immersive technologies such as MR? Uh, for Chris, you just mentioned an interesting term, how we, we need to package ourselves for, to attract investment. Um, how could you shed more light on that? All right. Um, Brian, do you want to take the first one? Or Chris, do you want to? I'll take Chris. I think Chris, just go ahead. You know, since. Okay, on, the, on the packaging, it's twofold. Um, I think Brian alluded to it that it's a team effort across 
the value chain. That's what he said. And team effort being, I'm good and talented and skilled on investing. But as much as I would have loved to, the few attempts I had on being on stage, either as, a, as, as, as an entertainer, were all flop. But I can partner with somebody else who has that talent, who has that passion, and who has the tenacity. Now, what is it that you package yourself as when you say, I'm a photojournalist? Is it just somebody who just walks around taking pictures on reality stuff or abstract stuff? Or is it somebody who can augment a bigger experience? And so therefore, corporates are attracted to you because you are the person who, if called for the function, the resultant images that come out are memories that people will never forget. I think you can notice the difference between the two. One is somebody who, who I think we typically call a paparazzi, and another is somebody who would typically be paid 100000 for two hours to come and document. Do you just take the pictures and send them, or do you take the pictures and send them back with narratives that bring back the experience and the memories? So a lot of it is in, and that's what I mean by packaging. I've had people who come with very good ideas, but the way it's packaged, they don't actually even understand the value of what it is that the customer will want for them. They might be, they might be selling the wrong aspect, or they may be highlighting the not-so-right aspect. That's the way I look at it. So it's all in what, what is it, and are you branding it, and is it an individual or is it an institution? Does somebody feel that if they were to invest in you, if something happened to you, that investment is gone, as opposed to invest in an organization, an entity that is more than and above just you as an individual? That's what we mean by packaging. Thank you very much, Chris. Brian? Uh, business model. So we have solutions that we create for bespoke solutions that we create for clients. These are on a one-off basis. They come and they leave. But one thing that has made us survive the tide is what we call scalable enterprise solutions. Solutions that can allow us to create while leveraging on the technology. For instance, AR menus. When you go to a restaurant, you can be able to scan menus and they come to life. So some of these scalable enterprise solutions have enabled us to st make money or not, not, I don't like saying making money, but gain resources throughout the year based on that. But another thing also, our business model is based on a 70-30 uh, ratio. 70% is both scalable solutions and uh, uh, scalable enterprise solutions and content. And then the other 30% is doing the meaningful work that we do. For us, the technology is we are responding to the technology by trying to understand what we can do for the local market and what we can do for communities. So the future of the technology, and I shouldn't be saying this, but I'm just telling you guys, is for us, VR and AR will always be on mobile. You have Oculus with their VR headsets, those ecosystems working for them. They don't work for us. So as long as we can leverage on the fact that we have a mobile phone, so in future, we're going to start building VR headsets and content platforms that are existing on your mobile phone. So this is more or less a business uh, model that we have. But we can talk about that later. All right, thank you very much. Cheers. Anybody else? Any questions? Um, there's one. Oh, yes. Um, where's the mic? So we have space for, I think, two more questions after that. Um, Hello. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Peter, founder of uh, Ren Hire Services, uh, my own company in the bookings and event uh, business. So my question is to Chris. Um, for a, a young company, uh, getting the attention of uh, brands. For example, I deal in booking of uh, event venues, whereby when I approach a venue and tell them uh, how we can work together, most of them want to know, have you dealt with a bigger client than I am so that I can trust you? Or how can you build the trust in terms of that? And uh, on the second request, can I get five minutes of your time after the event? Thank you. Was it for me or which Chris was it for? Uh-huh. 
Yes, you can get the five minutes, granted. <laughs> I think that's the more important one. Um, yeah. Now, before you answer, guys, please, we need questions of, uh, as well about policy. This is why we're here. Think about what do we need to do, you know, things like that, to move forward as well. Please, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is K-Dub Supreme. I'm a brand strategist, a creative producer, and an MC. My question is to all of you. How is it possible to survive the recession in the creative industry and the entertainment industry? Because you know this happens a lot, and we are the first people that when recession happens, people will cut ear. You understand? Yeah, like they they focus on other things, infrastructures, things that are tangible. So I'd like to know how is it possible, which ways? Probably can the government create a subsidies, because I've seen we have a government contact. And another question to my friend, <laughs> to, to, to the investor, I like to call you an executive producer, because you said you do what a label does, but as a person. Uh, what happened to the industry? Today we are talking so much about branding, image, music business. There's not all of that without talent. If you go to the US, uh, Sorry to say this, but in Kenya, they try, we try so much to put system in an industry where system doesn't work. If you go to, to, to other countries, probably I'm from the hip-hop side, so let's talk about, look at people like Rock Nation. They'll, they'll, they'll definitely work with someone like Kanye, other artists, but these guys are an addict, but we know they deliver. So what happened to that? I think everyone should stick to what they do. Let the artist, sorry to say this, but uh, most of the talented people don't even come to these forums. They up there in the gutter, smoking weed, doing what they're doing, but, but we know when you give them the mic, put them on stage, they'll deliver, you know? So can, can the, the, the entrepreneurs, the business people come to such forums, network, and then cause I'm very passionate about the African creative industry, you know. I think it's high time we stop putting this thing on the artist. Let's go look at the artist, where the artist is, and then probably this, this will be a challenge to everyone here. Uh, and if you see a good artist, please just do like what people did for Sufuri Zero. Put it on WhatsApp, put it everywhere, and then you send it out. And then I'm sure we can all move forward. Thank you. All right. Cheers. You should, you should have been a panelist. So, Chris, do you wanna do you wanna um, address the first one? Yeah, let me address the first question on brand. Um, gosh, I've even forgotten. The the preacher got me confused. <laughs> um, no, it's so so. Let's say you have a business, or and you you, you approach a client, or and then they ask you yes. if you work with someone bigger, bigger than, than them. So that they, yeah, yeah, just pick your so, so I'll answer that question and also part, part of what he said in terms of your question on what do you do in a recession, there's something called a freemium strategy. Freemium, not premium. <laughs> and um, in a freemium strategy, what you do is you give something for free in expectation of business later. Because the challenge is that when the economy is down, a company which could afford an artist at 200,000 for a performance will struggle to pay 100. But they may be able to do two or three performances or, or events. So the question is, what do you put on the table? Said so that even the client knows that you understand that if you took our ground, you're different. Because when things are thick, they're thick all across the value chain. Now, in terms of branding, yes, if you come to a big corporate, or if you go to a big corporate and you say, hey, I've just started this business, ABC, and I'd like to put your venue on my platform so that people book, they're always worried that is that booking going to get jeopardized because they're on your platform and you, they can't see anybody else as big as them there. The issue is that not everybody will be an innovator. Some people are innovators or early adopters. Others are late adopters or laggards. There are some organizations who will see you and it doesn't matter that you're big or you're small, they'll give you the business. And others, even after five years, it's not going to happen. Betty said something very critical over here, that Giuliani's brand is 15 years old. 
the challenge we have is that several times, a company that's one or two years wants to act or get business like it's 15 years. Mm. The truth of the matter is that there is no escalator to the top when it comes to business and the business of building brands. You have to build it over time. You have to be consistent. You have to be reliable. Like the way you said, leave the artist to do what they want to do. No problem. You can stay in the ghetto. You can stay wherever. You can smoke your stuff. Just make sure that when you get the mic, you produce stuff that people want to listen to, that people want to buy. If not, you will be the artist which was known as, and it will always be a ref reference to your past and the one hit wonder you have. The truth of the matter is that, yes, you're right. The whole value chain must work together. But everybody has to get serious about monetization and making revenue. Because if not, we all die. Thank you so much. Um, um, yes, she would like to. So she would like to say uh, something, Betty? Yes, yeah, so about how to survive the recession. Um, I would say uh, take a preventative approach where first we hold um, the government accountable uh, when it comes to implementing policies um, and acts and bills. Uh, because if you read the Constitution and the Copyright Act and the music policy and all of these documents, they say the right things but the implementation is where we fall short. Um, but it's like to some extent we are okay with the mediocrity because we're not pushing hard enough for these people who it's their jobs to make life easier for us. We're not pushing them hard enough to do their jobs uh, because there should be funding available for artists. There should be grants for, for you to get some money, uh, go away and just create and then come back and do something. Um, there should be grants, there should be money available for you to travel if you're invited to a concert somewhere else. Um, there should be a lot uh, of like structural things that would make life easier for all of us. And right now, while, I don't know, are we in a recess recession right now? Uh, but today, what we need to do is hold uh, the bodies, that is their job, hold them accountable and push hard until we have an environment where we can survive recessions. All right, thank you very much. Mike? Yeah, so first and foremost, um, let me be clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of government. So let's, let's get that very clear so that I can make my comments freely and well home. So first and foremost, to the gentleman who asked the question, let me ask you one question. Who's your MCA? Do you know? Great. Because a lot of, if I ask the same question to a lot of you in this room, you don't even know who your MCA is. So, in fact, Betty has said it so well. You know what? The reason why you're in this particular ditch that you're in is because, first and foremost, you elected the wrong people. Number one. So, thank you, congratulations, continue enjoying it. <laughs> because it is, you did it. You brought it upon yourselves. Number two, by a show of hands, how many of, this, of you in this room have ever been to public participation? Not less than this. It, it, it is a sprinkle. That is where the funds are divided. That is where you mobilize. And that is where you make your issues known. Because every single budget that is made right from the county level to the national government level is made with your input. So anything that you want, the mechanisms are actually there. The constitution is very, very clear. But the thing is this is that, how many of you have actually gone ahead and done your role and your part? And then the other thing that I must say, and this is about creatives in this country, you're very disorganized and you never come together. You never work as a team. And so long as you continue never working as a team, you'll never get anywhere. I have worked with creatives right from the early, um, you know, for, for more than 10 years. The Animation Association of Kenya, I was the founding chairman of that. So I do understand and I do know um, a lot about the creative industries and some of the, the issues that are involved. And the thing is this, is that we have to change our mindset, we have to change how we think, we have to change our strategy or nothing will ever change. Thank you so much. Um, I think we still have a bit of time for questions because no one is... Uh... Yes, sir.
So my name is Patrick Ojil. I'm from the Africa Digital Media Institute. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, could you, you please stand, stand up? We know you're very I'm tall. I'm a bit shy. Yes. Uh, so we are at the forefront of um, bridging the skills and capacity gaps for the creative and digital economies. My question goes to Betty, the one who manages Giuliani. Now, to what extent are you leveraging uh, the disruptive technologies to give Giuliani visibility across the continent? Because Giuliani could be a big artist in Kenya, but is he known in Cameroon or Mozambique, for example? And the reason why I'm saying this is because in 2018, when South Africa hosted the Global Citizenship Summit, headlined by Jay-Z and Beyonce, that event was dominated by West African artists and South African artists, and it's only Saudi Soul that was invited from East Africa. So what does that tell you? It means there's something that we're not doing that can attract um, the attention of the big event organizers across the continent. Ask yourself a question. Every time we're importing artists from the US, corp local, corp local corporates pay a premium for Rick Rose to come and perform, or Cardi B. But would Siroc or Coke pay a premium for Giuliani to go and perform at Coachella, for example? So yeah, that's hmm. something to think about. A tough one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a hard one. Um, so I guess to start with, we, we are creating, um, we're creating premium content um, and with that, with really good content, then we can use technology, we can use artificial intelligence to get the content out there to different parts of the world. Um, for, for the rest of it, we need the right kind of partnerships. Um, we need the right uh, distribution deal uh, to get our content out there to other parts of Africa. Um, we need uh, the right kind of partnerships with, um, um, I'd say, like the promoters and event organizers. Um, and most of all, we need, we need to really solidify his fan base, since majority of his fan base is here. Um, and I guess in the diaspora as well, uh, but mostly Kenyans. So we need to solidify his fan base uh, for the Sea Rocks and the Cokes to be able to see how much power we have. So if for our own things, if for our own events and merchandise and content, our fans are showing up and paying and engaging, then Sea Rock and Coke would make that endorsement for Giuliani to go to Coachella. Um, yeah, it's all um, a journey, and it takes consistency, um, and it's not easy for anyone, because if 16 years later, um, it's still not all glory, you know, there's glory, but there's a lot of, like, sweat and hard work and rejection, um, you can imagine how much harder it is then for people who are just starting out. Um, but consistency and um, creating good content, but most of all, showing... Um, the power of what we can do with the fan base and the audience that we already have right now. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, sorry, Chris, I just want to jump in. So, but uh, uh, one Patrick, minute. to answer, even 30 seconds, to answer okay, Thank you. your question in my opinion, there's no such thing as a Kenyan artist. It's just an artist. You either position yourself as uh, focused on the Kenyan market, which is a choice, East African market, which is a choice, or African market, or a world-class artist. I think the ch one of the challenges we have is we, we may not necessarily be as confident in ourselves as artists who are coming from Kenya to position ourselves from Africa. You said it right. What you found was South African artists and Nigerian artists. What's the difference? Those artists actually have positioned themselves for the whole of Africa. That's why they get called. The question is how are we branding, how are we positioning the artists over here such that they can have, if we keep on focusing on local fan base, we will be called for local uh, events. And that's why Diamond will come over here and people will drive all the way to Naivasha and they will pay money to go and see him. So let's do what we need to do to think bigger 
and to position ourselves better. And that way, I think we are going to get more international artists coming from Kenya, as opposed to Kenyan artists trying to go international. It's a branding issue. Thank you so much. Um, Brian, you wanted to say something? Yeah. Chris just said it, so I'll just emphasize on it. And let me tell you something. What you're talking about is exporting culture. Be exporting culture is big business. Exporting culture has to be something that you sit down creatively and with people who understand the business. Your consumer, when you're building, when you're building your brand as an artist, you have probably what you call a consumer profile. So who is my profile? What is the demographic that I'm trying to communicate to? And at the end of the day, it's not even about what, who you're trying to communicate to, the culture it, that you're trying to sell. What is the culture that you're trying to sell? I don't know if how many people here know Mudoni Drama Queen. You guys know um, perfect. Of course. This is like 10% of you guys. But when she's having shows in France, she would fill a whole stadium of 25,000 people. Nyayo Stadium holds 20, 30,000 capacity. I don't believe Mudoni Drama Queen would be able to do that here in Nairobi. Why? Because her positioning, that she said, her positioning is different. You have to think about music is a business, artistry is a business. So you have to think about it in that way. Thank you very much. Michael? Yeah, so I just want to make some closing comments very quickly. And here challenges the what are we doing and what are we committing to? So already, um, you know, I've done this for a couple of years and I continue doing it. So every single week without fail, if you go onto my LinkedIn profile, I keep posting fully funded opportunities for anybody who wants to get new skills and exposure from you know, internationally where you can learn new skills and you don't have to pay a cent for it. But going forward also, um, there's an the issue of not having enough funds and not having enough capital for the creatives and all that. So this morning I had a meeting and um, possibly in the next six months or so, we're looking into ways of unlocking new capital, a new capital injection um, from the Nordic countries and from the Nordic region. And we're gonna be working on that. So I'm gonna hold myself accountable with that. Thank you so much. Um, I follow Michael on LinkedIn, so what he says about <laughs> what he posts is actually true, you know? So, um, you've said, do you, would you like to add something? All right, um, how are we doing for time? All right, anyway. So, um, I would like to share something with you and then ask a question to the rest of the panelists. I was in Ghana in November, Cardi B, Cardi B was supposed to visit Ghana. But I was so surprised because I was told that she's not that famous in Ghana. This is Cardi B. And local artists are actually stronger than Cardi B in Ghana. And to fill up the stadium, what they had to do was to actually invite the right local artists. So uh, the gentleman here says something very important. Share the stuff. You know, we need to celebrate the artists that we have here, the content that we create here. Because this is how that artist that you claim you actually celebrate is going to make it to the top. I don't know what you guys have to say about that, but I see it says stop. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've gotten to the end of our session. Um, thank you very much to my panelists. And uh, I think it was really interesting. I wish we had a bit more time, you know, but... Um, I think it was very interesting, and thank you, thanks to you guys as well. Very interesting questions, uh, very good exchange. Have a good evening.